Okay, hello everybody. Um, well, the topic itself is not new. What is new is the way I have written it up. Um, and I have written it up in such a way that it is not targeted towards all people, but to ordinary human beings uh, who have to earn their money by uh, programming embedded systems uh, with C or whatever, but not with force. So I'm trying uh, to make a point in why they might want to use microcore nevertheless. The characteristics. So it is a computing engine written in VHDL for FPGAs. Um, I thought a long time about this term computing engine and I think it fits very well because a, the computing engine is capable of handling a lot. It has an architecture, of course, and it is capable of handling a lot of external events, uh, move around in memory and so on. And the instruction set itself um, besides the fact that you want to use the stack operators in some way, unless you use a C compiler in between, is pretty much uh, more or less application defined, or it can be application defined. So you can use a computing engine to adapt it to very different programming languages and create special instructions that uh, support uh, programming languages. For instance, uh, although Lisp is no longer a, a widely spoken language, the same as with Force, I think with microcore you could uh, build a pretty good Lisp engine as well. Anyway, so it is a computing engine written in VHDL for FPGAs. It has dual stacks. Uh, we know that. It is a Harvard architecture with 8-bit program and an independent data memory. And uh, this is one of the key points of microcore. The word width for the data memory and the stacks is configurable, which means uh, in the architecture file you have one constant that uh, says that, uh, with the name of data width and there you can set any widths um, in the framework, uh, with, within the framework of, I mean, 12 bits seems to be the smallest system because after all, you have to be able to address your program memory. And at present, given the cross compiler, 32 bit is the upper limit, but once, uh, the GeForce guys uh, get their act together with GeForce 1 and, and, and it, uh, when it will be released eventually, uh, then the cross compiler can be extended to 64 bits. Um, then the next feature is that it has a postfix instruction set architecture, which means the literal operands or addresses precede rather than follow instructions which consume them. And as we will see, this is the enable te enabling technology that makes the configurable work widths possible. Um, Microcore now has a single cycle execution and no pipelining. External events are interrupts, of course, and the pause, uh, which is something that I picked up from the transputer that used the pause, but in a very limited way. The user more or less had no uh, influence on, on, on what a pause would be doing. Then there are multiple or can be multiple data and return stack areas for efficient multitasking. So uh, with private data and return stacks, a full task switch on a, on, on a usual FPGA takes about seven microseconds. 
the program execution is deterministic, and uh, then there is an entire hardware software co-design environment. Uh, we will see the design flow if you work with microcore later. And as I already said, it has a multiple instruction set. I venture to say this because it is fairly easy to define new instructions. So, the architecture. Um, do you see my cursor on the screen? Hello? Hello? Yes, yes I see it. Yes, we see oh, it as a red dot. Okay. Well, we have the program memory here, and we have the data memory there. And here we have the data stack. The return stack shares memory with the data memory, and uh, the reason why I did this is twofold. For one thing, there are hardly any instructions that need to access the data memory and the return stack at the same time. And secondly, if the return stack is in data memory, you can build return stack frames that you can access through fetch and store. And the, as you can see, the data stack is completely decoupled from the program memory. The program memory is always at its wide. It has an address register that, that is new in microcore now. It, microcore used to have an instruction register, and uh, that was unfortunate because in FPGAs the block RAMs are built in such a way that you need, if you do a fetch, you need to latch the address first, which gets latched inside of the block RAM, and then in the next cycle you can access the memory. So instead of the instruction register, I now have an address, a, a program address register. And I mean, it pretty much looks like, like the uh, usual virtual machine of force. And then there are a couple and an extensible list of memory mapped registers, which are the status, the data stack pointer, return state pointer, interrupt flags, flags in general, even those that don't generate interrupts, a version register which tells you which VHDL version you are running there, a debug register that allows you to run the an, an umbilical link between the host and the target computer, a timer that gives you uh, time units, usually I do it I run it at 250 microseconds, and a rec control register that you can use to set single bits somewhere. Because the, 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 the paper was not directed towards uh, force programmers, I made some arguments, uh, stack versus register machine. And so I identified four points, parameter passing. Well, that's the same dreadful fact of both architectures that sometimes your arguments for subroutine call are not where they are supposed to be. And so in both architectures, you have to reorder arguments. So in that respect, they both have the same disadvantage. Interrupt processing is good for stack machines. No registers need to be saved and restored. As far as code optimization for other programming languages is concerned, uh, register allocation is a well-known topic. Stack allocation is still an esoteric topic, although the state of the art is already prepared for production systems. It's, it's optimizing quite good. Um, the Swiss University has done an experimental C compiler 
for an earlier version of microcore and the stack allocation they used uh, worked quite well. Instruction set impact. So the stack architecture has a very big advantage in that you do not need a register address field. So in a stack machine, um, instructions tend to be more compact. Looking at the technical merits, the stack architecture has several advantages and its major disadvantage is its unfamiliarity. Harvard architecture. So, as I said, microcores instructions in the program memory are 8 bits wide. The data memory is an independent memory with a configurable data width and microcore has no bytes. Each data memory cell is data width wide and as long as the data width is larger than 8 bits, you can happily store bytes in a memory data cell. Um, frankly, I believe uh, that the fact that most processes deal with bytes is a very unfortunate fact because it makes the hardware more complex than it needs to be and it doesn't really buy you any advantage with the exception that you can compress data easily which was i mean which was an issue uh, in the last century but no longer in the 21st century Postfix instruction set. This is the enabling technology for the configurable data width because the data width is completely, un I mean, the actual data width is completely unused in the job codes. Nowhere does it have some bearing on, on the uh, coding of the job codes. And the reason for that is that once an 8-bit opcode has the most significant bit set, then this is not an opcode, it, it is a literal or a part of a literal. So in the table below, you see um, two columns called lit flag and MSB. So the MSB means if the MSB is set, we have a literal instruction. And if it is not set, we have an opcode. And the lit flag is a flag in the status register, which tells you what the previous instruction was, whether the lit, the, the, the MSB in the previous instruction had been set or not. And so we have four different cases. The first one is an opcode that does not need a literal. There was no preceding literal and the opcode itself, of course, is not a literal and it doesn't need a literal to it. Then the lit flag may not be set, but then we encounter a literal instruction. And that means that the least significant seven bits of the literal instruction are pushed on the stack as a tooth complement number in the range minus 64 through 63 and the lit flag is set. Then the next case is, or let's go to the last case. So by way of, of this situation, uh, we wind up here, which means we had a literal instruction already in the previous instruction, and now we have another literal instruction following. And this is the mechanism by which the magnitudes of the numbers can be extended. So if we have only one literal instruction, we have the number range minus 64 through 63. If we have two, we are, go from minus 8,000 to plus 8,000 and three and so on. So that way you can construct on the stack a number of any magnitude. And that makes the microcore instruction set independent from the data workloads.
single side cycle execution means each instruction needs just one active clock transition. And that already implies that there is no pipeline involved. Microcourse instruction cycle may be several system clock periods long by way of a clock enable signal. And my, microcore itself may even be frozen external uh, from, from the outside by just disabling this clock enable signal. Uh, why is this important? Um, because microcore operates in only one clock transition, the asynchronous logic in the VHDL for microcore is comparatively slow. Uh, what comparatively slow means, we will see in the last screen. And very often you would have an FPGA with a system clock that uh, clocks more time critical logic blocks, uh, which is above the capability of microcore. And so in microcore, you can set, configure the system in such a way that you tell microcore of. Uh, how many system clock cycles are needed for one microcore instruction cycle. And another deviation from the single cycle execution is, for instance, the read access to FPGA block ramps. As I said, this is a two cycle, uh, needs to be a two cycle operation because in the first cycle you have to let the address and in the next cycle, you can read it. Um, and to this end, uh, I came up with a general instruction chaining mechanism that allows to define uninterruptible multi-cycle code sequences. And that can, for instance, also be used for read, modify, write instructions like the flash talk. External event. Uh, microcore has two different input signals to react to external events, which are interrupts and the pause. I mean, we all know what interrupts are, right? Um, I, I try to cast this into one sentence, the difference between the two and the result you see here. An interrupt is an event that happened that was not expected by the software. And the pause is exactly the opposite. An event did not happen that was expected by the software. Like, for instance, fetching a character out of the UART that was never, has never been transmitted. Each instruction is self-contained, and therefore, microcore may be interrupted between any two instructions. And, and chained instructions um, count as one instruction in that uh, sense. The pause. The pause, I mean, when I implemented the pause, uh, I had a new capability there and I didn't quite know what to do with it. And I played around with it for quite, uh, for a number of years now, and every now and then I found yet another useful use uh, for the poor sig uh, signal, but only in the last project I really found something that is really interesting. And that means in a multitasking uh, system, the pause trap allows to delegate mutual exclusion of resources to the hardware. So that you don't have to deal with it in the software any longer and uh, mutual exclusion and handling uh, access to peripherals, I believe are one of the most error-prone aspects of real-time embedded systems programming. And that can all be delegated to hardware and then everything is fine and easy in software. As you can see, uh, Starting, let's assume we have an eight channel, uh, we have an ADC with an eight channel input multiplexer, 
then channel number ADC store will start a conversion and then in the next line you can say ADC fetch sample store to fetch the result. And this seems like magic if you don't know the pause mechanism. But the way it works is ADC store will raise, which means the store operator itself, will raise a pause until the ADC is no longer in use by some other task. And in the next line, the ADC fetch will raise pause until the conversion has finished. And that way it is absolutely safe uh, to use peripherals in, in such a uh, simple way. And the last project I have been doing is proof of that that was quite a quite complex system uh, with altogether uh, five control loops. The hardware software co-design environment, uh, the VHDL code for microcore on a target system, of course. Then there is the Microforce cross-compiler and debugging on a host PC. Now that, that's the difficult thing. Um, I finally, after a lot of different uh, things I tried, I came up with a Docker a solution. It loads on top of the microcore slash GeForce 062 Docker image. The reason why I'm using GeForce 062 is that I have or I have to use it in order to get the cross compiler and the debugger working the way I want it. I have to heavily interfere with the interpreter and my hope was that recognizers would be a more portable solution but after I tried that um, I sat down and wrote a, a, a paper that is also part of the proceedings uh, and will be an impromptu talk, uh, rec a poor man's recognizer, because I came to the conclusion that Matthias Trude's uh, version of recognizers is over-engineered and far too complex. Um, okay, that, that was my, my rant on, on recognizers. Uh, so, on top of the Docker image, uh, everything works fine. And once uh, GeForce 1.0 is available and will be available on all kinds of distributions, um, I will then port the code to GeForce 1 because that will give me 64-bit access. Because after all, uh, the configurable word width is fine of microcore, but then the cross compiler has to support this word width. And at present, uh, the maximum microcore can do is 32 bits, and that's a limitation of the cross compiler. Then there is the two wire RS232 umbilical link uh, that connects host and target. That's pretty much standard. And, um, and, and you, you will have an interactive force command line interface mapped into the target that is able to do a lot of things uh, while you are active in the target. It can even uh, compile colon definitions which will be immediately loaded and can be executed. Then it has a, sing a disassembler that's nice. But it also has a single step tracer, thanks to Uli, who has done this a couple of years ago. And I now regard this as absolutely indispensable for stack checking, or otherwise I would not be able to write code where I have the feeling that everything is okay. Both microcore itself and the microforce cross compiler are based on a single file, which is the architecture package VHDL file that defines the architecture and all the opcodes. And because of this, uh, it is a co-design environment because you have one place where you can change anything and then both microcore itself and the cross compiler uh, will draw on that uh, architecture information.
And so you will never run in the situation where you produce code with a cross compiler for a version of microcore that you use a week ago or so. The design flow. As I said, this is this VHDL architecture file. And it uh, is the basis of the force cross compiler and uh, the microcore, the core itself. Uh, here I said microcore and application interfaces. Application interfaces means all the peripheral devices you have in your application design. And then the VHDL code itself may be uh, processed by two different uh, programs. One is the VHDL simulator and the other one is the synthesizer to produce actual configuration information. And the force cross compiler is also capable of producing different output formats and one output format is that it produces code for the program memory in the VHDL simulator. So you can happily simulate for uh, programs uh, with the VHDL simulator. And the other output is a binary image uh, of your cross-compiled code that uh, is loaded through the debugger and the umbilical into the FPGA that, of course, must have been configured before. And then you use the umbilical to do your debugging. Now, you have force code as the input to the force cross compiler, or that is not yet operational on the latest uh, microcore version. Uh, you may have C code and a C compiler that produces, uh, yeah, we made the decision that it produces force code, and then you use the force cross compiler for people optimization. More liberal instruction set. Uh, microcore at present has 47 what I call core instructions, 24 extended instructions, which are kind of luxuries, and all the 24 extended instructions can also be realized by macros. So if you don't load the instant extended instruction set, microcore just runs a little slower. And then five floating point instructions uh, that do nasty things uh, like uh, normalize or uh, build a floating point number or uh, convert a floating point number into stack items, which are the uh, exponent and the, oh, how do you call this, uh, the mantissa. Altogether, since, I mean, the literary instructions already take away, so to speak, 128 uh, instructions from the 8-bit uh, uh, instruction space. Um, we have 128 remaining instructions, which means we have 42 unused opcodes for application-specific instructions. And most of these unused opcodes, if they are undefined, are mapped to um, soft calls, which means if you execute a soft call opcode, then you wind up at a fixed address uh, binary trap instruction, uh, trap location. Getting Adding a new instruction is quite straightforward. It is a three-step procedure. First, you define the binary code for the new op in architecture package.dhdl. Secondly, you add a new when clause to the instruction decoder's case statement for the semantics of new op, and that's in the file newcontrol.dhd. And um, this, this is less intimidating as you might think. 
like things like drop or dupe are one-liners or two-liners. Most instructions at most have three or four lines. And the really complicated ones are uh, things like uh, do, uh, logarithm dualis or division primitives. And the third step is uh, you give new name, new the, the new operator a name in opcodes to f.fs to make it known to Microforce, and then you are ready to run with a new opcode. Instantiations. Microcore has been ported to Xilinx, uh, Lattice, Altera, and up to Microsemi FPGAs. And I made uh, some reference instantiations using a lattice LFXP2-8 compared to contemporary FPGAs. It's a small one. And so uh, we have the column instruction set that says it is either only the core or the extended or extended with floating point. And then different word widths, 16 bits, 27 bits, 32 bits. Well, you might ask why 27 bits. It's very easy. If you look at the block rams in FPGAs, they are not 8 bits wide. They are 9 bit wide. Because somebody at some point thought that it might be useful to have um, uh, an, an, an extra... Uh, a bit for error detection and therefore I mean why throw away this extra bit and so if your data memory consists of uh, three times the block RAM width we wind up with 27 bits so this is why 20 so actually I mean usually it would be 24 but uh, due to this uh, a feature of block RAMs, it's uh, 27 bits, which is nice because if you work with real signals, the, the, the best revolu the resolution you could possibly get from A to D converters is 24 bits. And so to have 27 bit data words is nice because you have extra guard bits uh, if you do. Um, control loop computations on the data. And then the, the last one is a 30-bit, a 32-bit implementation. Um, so the next field is slices. Slices is the number of logic block elements used in the FPGA. And you see, I mean, if you pack in more functionality and more bits, the number of slices you need goes up. But uh, compared to contemporary FPGAs, this is not much. Then both the data memory and the program memory are internal programs. So externally, the FPGA does not have any memory uh, connected. It is uh, a self-contained uh, microcontroller with its own memories. And so the data memory is also, if you have a wider word width, uh, the, data the, the, the block RAM memory in this LFXP28 is rather limited. So we have from 6K to 3K data memory, and we always have 8K program memory, which is a lot. I mean, a microcore port is, is comparatively very dense code. And in the last application with five control loops, I used uh, about 10 kilo instructions uh, for the whole thing to work. And that these here in the last column are the maximum clock frequencies you will get uh, out of the different configurations. And as you can see, 25 megahertz will always work. So you have a processor cycle time of 40 nanoseconds. Okay, that was it. Uh, thank you for uh, your attention and it's time for questions.
Yeah, thank you very much, Klaus. Um, I, yeah, yeah, are there any questions? I know Gerald was, uh, but uh, Glyn, go ahead and unmute. And, yeah. Um, so the I'm intrigued by the pauses. Uh, are they um, so? Is that equivalent to just blocking I/O, or is there some code that runs uh, that can run during the uh, during the pause, like like as with a with an interrupt handler, you might have a pause handler. No, yeah, of course. Uh, I mean, if you raise the pause. Um, wait a second, I go back here. The pause always occurs on a store instruction. And so the ADC is addressed and you try to store into the ADC, but since, I mean, I have written the interface code for the ADC myself, I know when the ADC is busy or not. Uh, by the way, with, with many, many ADCs, this is equivalent to the chip enabled signal of the ADC. And so the store is begun. And then I find that the ADC is busy and I raise the pause line, which means, and, and, and the action of this is that no, in that in the present cycle, no results of the operation are latched. So, I do not do actually. I, I actually do not do the store. Instead, I do a call of the post trap, or a, a, a branch to the post trap. And then in the post trap, I mean, I you have whatever you want to do there. If you have a single Thomas system, you define the pause trap as a semicolon, as an exit. And then it cycles on this very location in program memory and continually tries to do the, the store until finally the pause goes away and the ADC can be started again. But if you have a multitasking system, then you would just call the scheduler and do something else there. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Um, are there other questions? Okay, I know Gerald, you wanted to ask something. Yes, thank you. I actually want to add to the same topic, Klaus. I also wanted to know more about uh, the pause in the ADC. I was wondering if you have a primitive scheduler there if you could have uh, kind of weird um, race conditions. I was thinking about two tasks uh, reading different channels of the ADC. So what would happen if one task would then go into pause after saying ADC store, and then the next task resumes at ADC fetch? Would you have to make a smart scheduler? No, that, Please go ahead. Yeah, that is, that is just not possible. So if, if a task, Go, comes past the ADC store, then all other tasks are blocked from accessing the ADC. Ah. So they would just call and, pause again and then the scheduler would use the yeah, okay. and, and, and mm -hmm. the other task will continually get a pause. Right, right. And if if I do ADC fetch, then the system will wait until conversion has finished and I can do the fetch. But only after the fetch has been done, the ADC is given free for other tasks again. Okay. So it is absolutely clear that you say, I want this channel and the others can only access it if you have uh, fetched the result from this channel. Okay, if, if thank you. If you would have two analog digital converters, uh, and they are uh, accessed in uh, conflicting order, there's the chance of having a hardware deadlock then, is that right? Yeah, of course. I mean, this, this scheme uh, still, uh, you have uh, to think about potential deadlocks in your system. That problem does not go away. Which uh, uh, shows that it's uh, capable enough. So if it's so primitive that you can't do, can't do any deadlocks, then uh, it's normally too primitive. Ah. 
More questions? Okay, maybe later on I know that it's a very interesting topic and maybe this uh, night or uh, in the bio breaks there's the chance to still uh, ask Klaus questions. Uh, thank you very much again for your talk.